The Tom Woods Show, episode 1162. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, there are lots of ways to monetize your time online, whether it's through freelancing or affiliate marketing or blogging or hosting a podcast or self-publishing a book. I've done all these things and I know all the steps to follow. Check out my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income, over at pathstoincome.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Well, here's a news flash: The law schools are on the left in general. Well, I think we more or less knew that, but we've got some interesting new details thanks to an article by Mark Pulliam that ran over at Law and Liberty. We'll give you the link to that article at tomwoods.com slash 1162. And he's talking about an incident we'll get to in a second as a springboard for a more general exploration of what is happening in the law schools and what's driving it. Because obviously there's one particular point of view or at least one way of thinking that seems to be driving the school administration and that seems to be driving the hiring of faculty, questions like that. So we're going to hit this sort of stuff today with Mark, who is a contributing editor over at Law and Liberty, which you can visit, by the way, at libertylawsite.org. He retired from the partnership Latham & Watkins at the end of 2010 after joining in 1981, where he headed the employment law group in that office. He graduated from the University of Texas Law School in 1980. He's a member of the California Bar and is admitted to practice before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the U.S. District Courts for the Eastern, Central, and Southern Districts of California. Follow him on Twitter at Misrule of Law. That's pretty good. Twitter handle, Misrule of Law. Mark, welcome to the show. Good morning, Tom. I'm linking to your article today on the show notes page that you wrote, uh, I don't know, probably some weeks ago now, that had to do with the ideological composition of law schools. This is something that we more or less know about, but I don't think people realize just how bad it is. And you used as a springboard for that analysis an incident that occurred uh, not too long ago in which you had a a dean at a law school, more or less standing up in defense of the heckler's veto against somebody who had come to give a lecture on, of all things, free speech. Can you fill in the blanks on that episode? Sure. Uh, This was a uh, campus uh, event uh, hosted by the Federalist Society. The law professor who was invited to speak is a young mild-mannered libertarian uh, scholar who teaches at South Texas uh, School of Law, and uh, he has given a talk at a number of law schools on the importance of campus free speech. And students at the uh, City University of New York Law School uh, invited him to come up uh, to their school and address this topic. And when he showed up, there was a mob waiting for him uh, that was uh, disruptive, loud, uh, carrying signs, chanting. They were standing up in the front of the classroom where he was uh, intending to deliver his lecture. They were blocking the screen that he intended to use for his PowerPoint presentation. And they were uh, chanting a, a bunch of uh, slogans. One of them had a, a, a sign uh, to the effect that the First Amendment uh, it represents white privilege. And one of them said, and this is a law student, these are law students who are engaged in this disruption, said, F the law. And which was sort of an astonishing thing for somebody going to law school to have contempt for the subject that they're studying. And this went on long enough so that most of the people who came there to hear him left. And uh, it went on for a good 10 minutes before he was allowed to say anything, and it it sort of hamstrung his presentation. And uh, it attracted a lot of media attention because uh, he took a lot of pictures of it. Part of it was videoed, and it it went viral because of the irony of uh, somebody uh, being shouted down at a law school trying to talk about the importance of free speech on campus. But the astonishing thing to me, and I was one of the many people who, you know, watched this sort of like you would watch a a train wreck, it's sort of in horror, 
But then the dean of the law school, instead of coming out and apologizing for the conduct of the students, in effect said uh, they were behaving responsibly, that this was an exercise of their First Amendment rights to uh, engage in the heckler's veto, uh, which I thought just compounded the, uh, the foolishness of, this, of the student's behavior. But the thing that really got my attention as I was uh, reading the various media accounts of this is that uh, it mentioned that this dean, uh, Mary Lou Bilek, is on an ABA site visit team. And I did a little bit further research, and it turns out that she has a longstanding role with the American Bar Association in its section that has responsibility for reviewing accredited law schools because they have to be reviewed every seven years to have their accreditation renewed, and also schools seeking accreditation, which led me to write this piece for Law and Liberty, uh, kind of remarking on the fact that uh, the lunatics are not only running the uh, asylums, they're in charge of licensing them. You then say that you became curious about this, that here you have a publicly funded law school. It's always complaining that it doesn't get enough state funding. Why is it expending its scarce resources on issues like this and and so-called diversity and inclusion as opposed to just let's teach the law. That's the bare minimum reason that we're here. And what you found was that the American Bar Association has made one of the accreditation standards so-called diversity and inclusion, which as we know, there's the really it's it's a Moloch that can never fully be satisfied. You cannot imagine a point at which they say, all right, we're happy we've reached our goal, let's everybody pack up and go home. That's just never, <laughs> just never happening. Well, you know, I, one of the things I blog about is higher education. And so I spend a fair amount of my time just cruising the internet, looking at university websites, including my alma mater here in Austin, the University of Texas. You know, one of the things that you'll notice if you go to the trouble of looking is that every university and now every law school in America has a department of diversity and inclusion. And like a lot of academic bureaucracies, uh, once it gets started, it grows and grows and grows. And they tend to be populated with uh, people with dubious uh, credentials, earning very high salaries. And they sort of uh, are in charge of riding herd on the rest of the school to increase diversity and inclusion, which is a euphemism for quotas, making sure that certain ethnic and racial classifications are adequately represented. And so I had done some, you know, looking around previously at the University of Texas School of Law and had noticed that, you know, since I graduated many years ago, now there's this diversity and inclusion uh, infrastructure. And I kind of scratched my head at the time wondering, I wonder why that is. But Lo and behold, I'm looking at these ABA standards and rules for accreditation, and there is a standard that is called diversity and inclusion, and it more or less requires law schools to have this type of bureaucracy to ensure that students uh, are diverse uh, with respect to gender, race, and ethnicity, and also faculty and staff. And it's not just something that you have to pledge that you're going to make your best efforts. You have to demonstrate through results that you are achieving these goals. And they go so far as to say that if a law school is located in a state that purports to prohibit consideration of gender, race, ethnicity, or national origin, as is true, for instance, in California and Florida, that is not a justification for a school's noncompliance with standard 206. So uh, I began, it, I sort of realized, well, gee whiz, uh, there's something driving certainly the law schools in this direction. And the ABA is the person riding herd on this. And they're using this standard two, 206 as uh, the, the weapon, in effect, to uh, obtain compliance. I want to ask about the ABA in particular. Is it able to get away with this because of its just its overwhelming position with respect to the legal profession? Or is there some way that ABA accreditation is is 
What's the role of the state in all this, what I'm driving at? Is this just, we have a private association called the ABA, and we have these rules, and you don't have to follow them, but if you don't, you won't get accredited? Or is there the fist of the state beneath the accreditation process in some way? Well, the fist of the state is always involved whenever you have a monopoly misusing its power, and that's certainly the case here. Uh, I think you can look at the ABA and its role in legal education as sort of a case study in both interest uh, group politics run amok and also the evil effects of uh, cartelization. Uh, Here, the legal profession sort of regulating itself to limit competition and to increase its members' uh, power and uh, 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 the money that they're able to earn. The monopoly status that has been conferred on the ABA comes from two different sources. The federal government, through the Department of Education, has made the ABA an official accrediting agency for law schools, which entitles people attending ABA accredited law schools to be eligible for federal financial aid. And and federal financial aid is the driver that basically enables much of the dysfunction in higher education today because people are not spending their own money and uh, everything you know, costs more than it should and consumers don't really look at uh, the pros and cons uh, because the federal government is loaning them the money which they may or may not ever uh, have to repay. The other source of monopoly power comes from the state Supreme Courts each of which is responsible for regulating the legal profession in its state. And uh, over the course of a hundred years that the ABA has been involved in uh, regulating legal education, they've managed to get 45 state Supreme Courts to make graduation from an ABA accredited law school a condition of eligibility to take the bar exam in those states. So. The ABA has a monopoly at both ends of the legal education continuum, uh, you know, in order to receive federal loans to attend law school and in order to be able to take the bar exam after graduating from law school, the ABA has to give its blessing. And so over the course of a hundred years, it has, uh, its role and its influence has grown. And I think your listeners have to remember that there was a time not that long ago in American history where very successful lawyers were able to achieve national acclaim without ever having attended law school. Abraham Lincoln is an example of a lawyer who never attended law school. And you may say, well, that's a long time ago. That's a different era. But even in the 20th century, one of the most uh, distinguished lawyers we had, Robert Jackson, who was an attorney general of the United States who served on the U.S. Supreme Court and who was the lead prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials, never attended law school. He studied law with a a lawyer in upstate New York, learned enough to be able to pass the bar exam, and had one of the most distinguished careers of, of any lawyers in the 20th century. So this notion that we need the ABA to do all of these things to ensure that only competent people are practicing law is a myth, but it's a myth that has become so firmly ingrained in the uh, American consciousness that nobody really questions it anymore. And as a result, they're able to get away with all of these things uh, that are, I think, making a dysfunctional legal education system even worse. So if that's its mythical purpose, if we may say that, what is the actual real-world result of the existence of the ABA? What does it actually accomplish? Well, you know, the ABA does a lot of different things. It is a left-wing special interest group that purports to be, uh, you know, speaking on behalf of the legal profession, but... uh, Many, most lawyers, I don't, I think don't belong. I, I belong when I practice law because my law firm paid the dues, but I quit in the wake of the, uh, Clarence Thomas confirmation battle, uh, when, uh, the Senate confirmed eventually Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court, despite allegations being made by Anita Hill, uh, you know, 
showing that uh, at least a majority of the Senate didn't believe Anita Hill. Well, afterwards, the ABA gave Anita Hill an award, uh, which sort of is uh, an indication that the ABA, the leadership at least, believed Anita Hill and disbelieved Clarence Thomas, which put it at odds with the Senate. And that's when I realized that the ABA is nothing but uh, a liberal special interest group. And if you compare the policy positions that the ABA takes, and they have a conference of delegates that meets every year, and uh, they have, a, a, in effect, a political platform, it's indistinguishable from the ACLU. And you know, every controversial legal issue, and some that aren't even legal issues, they're purely political issues, they take the point of view that would be considered you know, uh, to the left. And uh, so not only are they to the left of center of the American public, they're left of the legal profession and the legal profession as a whole is left of the American public. But that's fine because people can listen to or ignore the ABA as they wish. They can join or refuse to join the ABA as they wish. The other thing that the ABA does is it from time to time plays a role in rating uh, the president's judicial nominees to the federal bench. And this becomes particularly important when you have Supreme Court nominations. And some Republican administrations, to their credit, and George W. Bush, one of the courageous things he did was he basically said, I'm not going to pay any attention to your ratings anymore because they're frankly not credible. It used to be that presidents would uh, elect the ABA vet nominees before he made them official. Uh, and, and George W. Bush said, I'm not, I'm not going to do that any longer. But with respect to legal education, I think this is where their, uh, their influence is the most nefarious because it is the least visible. And also it has the least to do with their true mission, which is to ensure the integrity of the legal profession. And what they have done with their regulation of law schools is turn them into uh, dysfunctional uh, social justice academies with uh, that exhibit all the worst characteristics of higher education generally, but uh, to a further degree. For instance, um, faculty compensation. You know, the average law professor makes several times what the average uh, college professor makes, even though they work probably less hard. Uh, and so they've, in effect, the ABA, by insisting on the use of full-time faculty, by insisting on ridiculous uh, student-faculty uh, ratios, by insisting on tenure and other things, have created this monstrosity of overpaid law professors, which drives, of course, tuition higher. And so you have uh, tuition has gone up two or three hundred percent in the last 20 years at most uh, law schools. And students now uh, typically have to borrow huge amounts of money to attend law school. They graduate with one hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt into a job market that is uh, worse today. The ABA doesn't have anything to do with that, but uh, they, they really are uh enabling a legal education system that uh, is disserving, utterly disserving the students. All right, before we continue this disturbing tale, let me pause to say a brief word to my business owners and indeed would-be business owners. Access to capital can be difficult, risky, and expensive for business owners, especially when it's tied to your personal credit. That's why a lot of authorities recommend that you obtain business credit to separate consumer and commercial credit reports and make yourself more lendable. Credit Suite empowers business owners and entrepreneurs to get the money they need to grow their business even when they can't get money at their bank. And it helps business owners build business credit for their EIN that's not linked to their personal social security number. Regardless of their personal credit quality, regardless of cash flow, regardless of collateral, no personal guarantee needed, and even when they can't get bank financing. Credit Suite also helps companies obtain business loans and credit lines through over 1,000 different lenders. It has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and a five-star ranking with Trustpilot. You might be surprised to know that any business can qualify for business credit, even startups, if it follows the proper steps to obtain it. 
They map out these steps in their free guide, which you can get at creditsuite.com slash woods. That's credit, S-U-I-T-E dot com slash woods. All right, let's get back to it. But the worst thing they do has to do with this diversity and inclusion. And uh, I, can, I can talk about that in using George Mason University Law School as an example. Now, George Mason uh, Law School is a very good law school. George Mason was initially a, a branch of the University of Virginia, who went independent and has a highly acclaimed campus, has one of the best law and economics programs in the nation, and has a very good law school that has been uh, ABA accredited for a very long time. Uh, and because it is one of the few conservative law schools, which doesn't mean that every single person who teaches there is conservative, but that they have a critical mass of conservative thinkers on their faculty. Uh, in the early 2000s, they had a policy that was, uh, in order to maintain the quality of the school, they were going to have uh, high admission standards, which they would enforce across the board. And uh, as a result, they only had about 6% of their student body were minorities. So the ABA sent one of its site teams out, and this is the uh, like the health inspector that uh, this uh, Mary Lou Bialik would have served on a team like this. And uh, they were visiting George Mason in advance of its renewal of its accreditation. And they said, well, we don't like your numbers. You're not doing enough to have a diverse and inclusive student body. And George Mason's response was, well, you know, we have a terrific outreach program. We, we try our very best to encourage uh, qualified uh, minority uh, applicants to uh, seek admission. And the ABA said, well, that's not good enough. Uh, you have to do more. So they hired an assistant dean in charge of outreach and they increased their outreach efforts, which costs money, which then gets you know, translated into higher tuition. And the ABA came back a year later and they had doubled their numbers. And the ABA said, it's still not good enough. And so they went and uh, even tweaked their admission criteria some to let in some uh, minorities who would not have otherwise met the, uh, the admission standards. And the ABA came back a year later and said, you're still not doing good enough. And by this time, they had tripled the number of, uh, of the percentage of uh, minorities in their incoming class. And they said, overall, you're doing well, but you do not have enough African-Americans. And only when the ABA told George Mason that you are not going to get your accreditation renewed unless you increase the number of African-Americans in your entering class, did they lower their admission standards enough to be able to accommodate that dictate. And then uh, the ABA said, okay, fine, we'll get, give you your renewal, but we're going to be watching you for next time. Now, the tragedy in this is that as Richard Sander and Stuart Taylor have documented in their book, Mismatch, when you admit into a, a law school minorities who are not equipped to compete at the same level as other students in the class, you actually hamper their academic performance. And those students do worse in a uh, in such an academic environment than they would had they been admitted into a school with a peer group more representative of their uh, academic background and qualifications. And a lot of them drop out, and the ones who don't drop out uh, fail the bar exam in uh, higher numbers. And this is after they've incurred a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt. And lo and behold, we are seeing this phenomenon across the country with uh, students who have graduated from a three-year course of study at an ABA accredited law school failing the bar exam in record numbers. In fact, over the weekend, a news report came out from California that uh, 
announced the results of the February application of the bar exam in California, only 27.3% of the students who took the bar exam passed it, which was the lowest pass rate in history in California. So instead of improving the quality of legal education, I would submit that the ABA through these diversity dictates have actually worsened it and have greatly increased the expense in the process. It's, uh, it is a complete failure of regulation. Well, that answered one of the questions I was going to follow up with, which is, what's the big problem with diversity and inclusion? Those sound like innocuous enough terms. Now, by the way, of course, we know that that's the tactic the left uses. They take innocuous sounding terms, and then they use them as bulldozers to destroy everything in their path. But of course, your point is that even on their own terms, it's not at all obvious that you're benefiting the very people who are supposed to be benefited by these programs. So really what's going on here is an, an ideological putsch at these institutions. Now, I, I want to ask you before we wrap up, if you could share a little bit about a professor from your alma mater, even though you may not have studied under him, you know him and have chronicled uh, his life, and that is Professor Lino Gralia. And I fear many of my listeners will not be familiar with him, but my friend and co-author Kevin Gutzman studied under him and, and just thinks the world of him. He seems to have been a one-man juggernaut against this, uh, this whole ideological trend, and I'd like you to say a few words about him. Well, Lino Grali has been teaching at the University of Texas School of Law for over 50 years. I did a profile of him on my blog, Misrule of Law, uh, if your listeners are interested. And Lino has been a stalwart opponent of uh, racial preferences and admissions in higher education and against busing when busing was a initiative that was being promoted by the Supreme Court. And he paid a heavy price for that. Uh, in terms of his uh, career, uh, President Reagan was intending to uh, nominate him to a vacancy on the Fifth Circuit, and uh, the ABA, as we talked about, came out very strongly against him, condemned him as somebody who was unfit for the bench, who lacked judicial temperament, et cetera, which is all their buzzwords for holding uh, policy positions we disagree with. And as a result, uh, Reagan uh, never did uh, uh, put him on the Supreme Court or on the Fifth Circuit. The, and then in uh, the late 90s, uh, he made some remarks uh, trying to explain why certain uh, ethnic groups uh, didn't do as well academically as others. And he was intending to compare uh, Hispanics with either the, the, the Jewish Americans that he attended college with at the City College of New York or uh, Asians. And he simply said that uh, uh, some cultures do not place as much importance on academic achievement as others, which is almost a self-evidently true statement, yet he was denounced by uh, everybody at UT, a majority of his uh, peers on the faculty, the, the administration of the university. It's, it's really shameful. Yeah, Mark, apparently we're, we're to believe that every culture places the mathematically precisely equal emphasis on education. What a preposterous thing to believe. And, and, and the thing is, it seems to me probably a good chunk of the people who profess to be outraged knew in their heart of hearts this is the most obvious commonplace observation somebody could make. Well, and this shows exactly what's wrong with the bastardization of diversity inclusion. Uh, what we have in the law schools today and to a lesser extent in higher education as a whole is it's become a liberal echo chamber. And we only have one point of view represented. We have a complete lack of intellectual balance that Lino Gralia is the only conservative, true conservative on the UT law faculty. And when he retires at the, at the end of this year, uh, he will not be replaced by anybody like him. And the number of true outspoken conservatives in legal academia today, you could probably count on one hand. And so the ABA goes to great lengths to promote diversity and inclusion, but they're not talking about intellectual diversity or intellectual inclusion. They're talking about racial and ethnic quotas and the last thing they want is intellectual diversity. And when you crowd out any opposing point of view, 
the remaining voices just sort of turn into a mob. And uh, there is no check. There is no constraint. And it, uh, it turns into just over the top rhetoric and groupthink. And it's a, it's a real shame uh, that that has happened. And uh, if it doesn't turn around, law schools will continue down this road of just becoming uh, social justice academies and in, in, you know, places where people become indoctrinated to become activists, like the City University of New York Law School, uh, that's pretty much what they do. They specialize in promoting uh, social justice warriors. And the last thing society needs is more of those. What's Gralia's area of specialty in the law? He, um, he traditionally taught uh, constitutional law and antitrust. And the shameful thing about constitutional law is generally taught as a first year course. And so when you're in your first year of law school, there are certain courses that you have to take, property, torts, contracts, constitutional law. And you are assigned whoever you're assigned. You don't get to pick. And so with the advent of affirmative action and with this advent of hypersensitivity to everything having to do with diversity and inclusion, some black students objected to being assigned to Lino Gralia's class because Lino Gralia uh, taught constitutional law in a way that sort of pushed back against some of uh, the case law dealing with uh, preferential admissions, uh, busing, uh, these sensitive areas. And uh, those students were allowed to opt out of his class. And finally, he became controversial enough that the dean of the law school uh, took him out of the rotation for teaching constitutional law at all, even though he was considered one of the nation's leading scholars in that field. Again, this is at the same time that they're purporting to promote diversity and inclusion, they're silencing the only voices in legal academia questioning this orthodoxy in the area of constitutional law. One last thing. Obviously, he wrote articles for law reviews, but did he ever write a book? He wrote a book, uh, Disaster by Decree. That's right. On the busing phenomenon. And a lot of people have forgotten about busing, but... You know, the remarkable thing is the Supreme Court has been on many crusades over the course of the last 50 or 60 years. And most of them, once they got on a bandwagon, they never turned back. Uh, the one area in which they did draw back was busing. And uh, this was a lot of it was done under Warren Burger, who was a Republican appointee uh, as a chief justice. And the federal courts, the Supreme Court said the Constitution required uh, local school districts to uh, assign uh, students uh, so that you had racial balance in all schools, regardless of residential housing patterns. It was hugely controversial, but nevertheless, they persisted until Lino wrote this book, and it was like somebody taking a pin and pricking a balloon. And all of the intellectual force of this entire body of law disappeared and the Supreme Court eventually dropped the whole busing body of law like a, a lead, like a lead balloon. And uh, so I think that's one of his uh, lasting achievements is uh, almost single handedly turning the tide on uh, a, a disastrous uh, body of, uh, of Supreme Court doctrine. And then finally, tell me about Law and Liberty, which is over at LibertyLawSite.org. Uh, Law and Liberty is a project of the Liberty Fund, which is a longstanding classical liberal uh, foundation uh, located in the Indianapolis area. Um, and they have a catalog of uh, books devoted to liberty and they put on academic conferences. And one of the things they've done under uh, the auspices of uh, Richard Reinch, who's the editor, is they've created this blog where uh, they try to present a version of uh, you know, legal analysis that is free of the left-wing groupthink that's so dominant everywhere else. So you have uh, national scholars uh, opining on legal topics uh, and constitutional law topics from uh, a libertarian, a conservative, and a classical liberal point of view. And 
if you uh, have uh, listeners who um, are uh, amenable to that uh, point of view, uh, I would highly encourage them to read it. There's fresh content there every day. And it's not just about legal analysis. They do uh, occasional movie reviews, uh, stuff dealing with the popular culture. It's, uh, it's, it's quite an engaging site. Well, I appreciate your time and your important work over there. I'll definitely link to the Law and Liberty work that you guys are doing over at uh, tomwoods.com slash 1162. I'm also going to link to your original article that sparked this whole thing. And, you know, sometimes I, I want to check people out before I have them on. So I forwarded you along to um, Kevin Gutzman. I said, do you know this guy? And he came back with uh, – he agreed with everything you said and you know if if anything he's understating how bad it is <laughs> i thought all right great 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 we'll do it so libertylawsite.org is what all you uh, people interested in the law and its perversion uh, should be checking out and mark thanks so much again oh it was a pleasure anytime all right everybody before i let you go a few things to tell you about you got to come to new orleans if you possibly can june 30th 2018 and I'm, I hate to put some of this stuff on the podcast because after June 30th, this is just wasting everybody's time. But it's so important. This is the Mises Caucus of the Libertarian Party putting on this event during the Libertarian Convention, off-site but not very far away. And it's going to have just fantastic people there. Dave Smith, I believe, be the MC. Scott Horton will be speaking. Michael Bolden, I'll be speaking Jordan Page will be performing. Eric July and Backwards will be performing. Murray Sabrin will be speaking. It's going to be a smorgasbord of liberty and awesomeness. And it's important for us to get a lot of people there. So if there's any conceivable way you could come to New Orleans on June 30th, carpool, figure out some kind of arrangement, whatever. Uh, obviously, I mean, I can't speak for other people, but I'm certainly not taking a speaking fee for this event. I'm just getting there to uh, support this thing because it's really, really important. So I really would like it if you could possibly be there. Uh, June 2nd, remember the Mises Institute's having an event. You can get in for free if you're a supporting listener of the show. So supportinglisteners.com is where to go to become one. And then just drop me a note at bonuses at tomwoods.com if you'd like to go to that event. We've got some fun topics coming up this week, including the Spanish-American War. So we'll be doing some history and also the Frankfurt School and so-called cultural Marxism. We haven't actually done an episode on that. So we're really going to get to the bottom of what that's all about. Lots of fun stuff coming up this week. So make sure you subscribe. Don't just listen to a fleeting episode here and there. Subscribe on iTunes by going to tomwoods.com slash iTunes. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.